So today I'm wrapping up this three-part sermon series that I've titled Mission Possible. And my hope is with these three sermons that they will spark a continuing conversation among you, a conversation about how we view ourselves as a congregation and how we intend each of us to live out our lives of faith as individuals, but also as a church. As I've mentioned before, I have composed a mission statement for the congregation. And it's not meant to be a definitive statement for the church, but instead it's more of a working document um, designed to fuel a larger conversation. If at some point in the future we do wish to develop a more specific statement for our church, that would be wonderful. But the important thing is that we are proactive in determining how we will live as Christians. Now, the mission statement that I have composed um, is printed in the, on the bottom of your bulletin there. And it says that First Presbyterian Church is, quote, a welcoming community of disciples of Jesus Christ continually demonstrating God's reign. Now, two weeks ago, in the first week, we studied the earliest church as it is described in the book of Acts, and we ask how it is that we might model ourselves after that particular Christian community who were living together, living in common, sharing all they had, and caring for one another. And then on top of that, we also ask how, as such a community, we would be welcoming, sharing hospitality with those who come into our midst. And then, in the second week, last week, we explored the challenge of being disciples of Jesus Christ, and we looked at how we are called to carry a cross, our cross, a cross that requires that in some manner that we die. Today, I am now focusing on the kingdom of God, and we find in the final phrase in the mission statement, continually demonstrating God's reign. Now, the challenge of the kingdom of God is that nowhere in Scripture is the nature of this kingdom defined or described for us. I mean, it's just assumed that everybody knew what it was, and, and they did. It's kind of like baseball. We can talk about baseball without having to define it every time we mention it. Um, it's the fabric of our culture. If I were to say, for example, you know, last week's sermon, it was a grand slam. Now, you may disagree with me on that, and <laughs> but at least you got the baseball reference. Now, we may not have a comprehensive definition of the kingdom given to us in Scripture, but that doesn't mean that the Bible is silent on the subject. No, the kingdom of God is mentioned in one way or another 162 times in the New Testament alone. Now, the first thing that we need to know about the kingdom is that it is the core of Jesus' message. Jesus said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This was his message, that the kingdom had arrived. It had come near. This is indeed the good news that Jesus brings. The kingdom was within the grasp of the people. All they needed to do was repent, to turn and redirect their lives. This idea of the kingdom has its roots in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament story of the Exodus specifically. And you recall that God delivered the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt and led them into the wilderness. And while they're in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, God makes the offer. God offers to be their king if the Hebrews will be 
God's people. And this idea of God as king becomes an aspiration that will haunt the Israelites for generations. God holds up. God's into the bargain. God is their faithful king, but the people are less than faithful subjects. And so this vision of living in God's reign, it just always seems to be beyond their grasp. Jesus' radical message for the people to whom he preached is that the kingdom indeed is present. I like to think that maybe Jesus said something like, you know that kingdom that we're all expecting, that kingdom we're all looking for? It's here. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is truly at hand. Repent. All you need to do is repent. Turn your lives around and you will see the kingdom. And yet, despite Jesus' assurance, the kingdom remained elusive. If the people just knew what to look for, they might see it. And they did see it. We all see it in little glimpses when we look, but we just can't seem to grab onto it. Jesus said that to receive the kingdom, we must become like little children. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. To receive the kingdom, we must set aside our ambitions of power. We must adopt the humility of a small child. And in a similar way, Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The poor, in this instance, are humble because they have no power. We have to be like that. In another place, Jesus teaches that in order to gain access to the kingdom, one's righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the scribes and the Pharisees, well, they were known to uh, give the appearance anyway of being righteous. But to enter the kingdom, we've got to do more than that. We can't just appear righteous. We must become righteous in our hearts. We have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. However, where Jesus really says the most about the kingdom, where we, we understand its meaning, is in his parables. And in the parables, he tells us things like, well, the kingdom is like a seed sown in the ground and it grows and we don't know how and then one day it pops up and we must harvest it the kingdom is also like a net sunk down into the water where we can't see it but when we pull it up it is full of fish and the kingdom is like yeast hidden in flour it is unseen there in the flower, but it does cause the dough to rise. Now I could spend hours talking about what the Bible tells us about the kingdom, but I really want to get back to that mission statement. The mission statement says that we as a church are a welcoming community of disciples of Jesus Christ continually demonstrating God's reign. Now you'll notice that I said God's reign and not kingdom of God. And there's a reason. Well, for one thing, the Bible's not consistent on the use of that term. The Ma Gospel of Matthew, for example, it prefers to say kingdom of heaven, not kingdom of God, but we view these as being the same thing. But the bigger reason is that for some decades now, scholars have quietly been urging us to move away from this term kingdom and because for one thing we as americans we don't have an instinctual understanding of a kingdom we fought a war to escape being part of a kingdom and furthermore and this is the important part that word kingdom in english is really not the best interpretation translation of the greek word the Greek word is basileia. In English, a kingdom 
When we say kingdom, we're describing a place, a place with certain political boundaries. It's a place where a king rules. If you leave the kingdom, if you, if you cross the boundary, you leave the kingdom. For example, one kingdom that exists today is the nation of Jordan, and it's ruled by King Abdullah II. When you go into Jordan, you're in the kingdom. When you leave, you're out. But this word, Basileia, it doesn't describe a place so much as it describes the authority that is exercised by a king, specifically the king's authority to rule as king. So when we talk about God as king, we aren't speaking of a place where God rules. Instead, we're speaking of, we're describing a reality, a reality that coincides with our own reality. So in that mission statement, I chose to use the word reign, as in God's reign, because God reigns everywhere. Just as a side note, um, theologians in sort of pushing kingdom away, they've been looking for a better word, a perfect word to describe God's ultimate reign. They haven't found it yet, but one proposal that gets bounced around is the word um, kinship, not kingship, but kinship. And kinship implies that in God's reign, we are all one family. And this word doesn't just come out of the blue, but it's supported in the words of Jesus who said, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother, my family. So when we do the will of God, we become part of this family of God, kinship. But that's a whole nother sermon, but it is interesting. So back, back to our mission statement here. We as a church, we should be a welcoming community of disciples of Jesus Christ, continually demonstrating God's reign. Our task as a church is to model for the world what it is like to live in God's reign. And we are to do this day in and day out without ceasing. There is no time off for good behavior. It's what we do as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are to demonstrate what life is like in God's reign. Um, I think I look at it as being like those people who work at a place like Colonial Williamsburg, who are experts at demonstrating how people lived and worked in a particular time and place. You can go and talk to them, and they will talk to you as if they are living in the 1700s and they're taking you back with them so that you can learn. And, you know, they do this all the time, even in August when the sidewalks are melting in the heat and the tourists are dressed in flip-flops and skimpy t-shirts. These historical interpreters are sweating it out in their period costumes, which are always made of wool. Why? Because they are committed to demonstrating a particular way of life so that the visitors may learn. That's what we do. Demonstrate a way of life. We as Christians, as disciples of Christ, as members of a welcoming community, we are to be models of godly living, demonstrating godly living. And whether we do it here at the corner of West Main and Greenwood or out in the world somewhere, we are to live differently than the rest. We are wearing our itchy costumes while everybody else is in their flip-flops and t-shirts. And we are to do it even if it makes us uncomfortable or sweaty or puts us even in danger because that is the cross that we bear to live a different life. In our scripture passage today from Matthew's gospel, we read where Jesus calls his 12 disciples and he gives them power. He gives them the power to cast out unclean spirits and cure disease. Actually, what he gives them is 
authority. Remember, God, a, a king, uh, has the authority to rule. Jesus gives them the authority to heal. And we know exactly who these disciples are because Matthew lists them for us here. It's Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas. And these are the ones who will go on to build the church in Jesus' name. And Jesus sends out these 12 with specific instructions to proclaim the good news, saying the kingdom of heaven has come near. And he tells them that they are to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. They are to demonstrate a new way of life in the world. And they, when they do this, they're not to take money. They're not to take extra clothes. They're not to take any of the stuff I had with me. And he tells them, if anybody refuses to listen to what they have to say, they're not to beat their heads against the wall. No, nope, just shake the dust off your feet and move on until you find those people who do want to listen. And we are the church, and we are the spiritual descendants of, those, of that original 12, and we have the power to do more than we can imagine. We can indeed work miracles. We can change lives. We have the ability to demonstrate to the world what it's like to live with God as our king and we as God's people. This is what we as a church are called to do. And it is our job to figure out how we do it. And that is what I want us to talk about with this mission statement. How are we going to do it? I mean, we're already doing wonderful things, but let us be proactive about it. How are we going to be a welcoming community? full of disciples that continually demonstrate who God is so that the world may find that salvation themselves. What we do is wonderful. What we do is sacred. And it is why each week we pray those words, thy kingdom come. Amen.